City planning in the 21st century demands that we prioritize pedestrians more than ever. After all, we've finally realized the limitations of cars. They certainly have their place in society, but they're expensive, polluting, and simply cannot move as many people as public transport can. For commuters to get between public transport and their destination, active transport links are required. Active transport is a mode of transportation, in fact, which uses stored energy to move the particles against the concentration gradient. Wait, that doesn't sound right. Oh, right, here we go. Active transport links are primarily those that rely upon physical activity as a means of transport, including travel by foot, bicycle, and other non-motorized vehicles. Increasingly, city planners are trying to build cities for people, not for cars. So, imagine this. Imagine you're walking down the road, minding your own business, when your footpath just suddenly ends. Suddenly, your footpath has just turned into grass for no apparent reason. What? Who designed this? Sadly, pedestrian infrastructure fails like this exist all over Sydney, where cars are put before people. And as you'll soon come to realize, that is not a good thing. Before I continue, massive shout out to my monthly Kofi supporters. Please do consider supporting me if you can. Also, please subscribe if you haven't already, and do be sure to check out the rest of my channel, your go-to YouTube destination for all things city planning, after the video. Transport for New South Wales has begun promoting 15-minute neighbourhoods, which will be achieved by prioritising placemaking, walking, bike riding and micro-mobility to support 15-minute access to everyday destinations and local transport networks. They've said that they want walking and cycling to be the preferred mode of transport for short distances, noting that many people rely on a car due to long distances, limited travel choices and lack of infrastructure. <laughs> lack of infrastructure, you can say that again. Right now, I'm in Collaby on the east side of Richmond Road. I'm on a cycle path which, as you can clearly see, abruptly ends for no apparent reason, just south of Alderton Drive. Why? Why go to all the effort of building a cycle path if it's just going to end here abruptly? How could you be that short-sighted? Some quick digging reveals that this cycle path has ended here ever since its construction in 2014. Clearly, they planned for it to continue, but those plans just never came to fruition. I mean, the pathway continues on the west side of Richmond Road, so why build it on both sides? That makes sense to me. Such short-sightedness can be found all over Sydney's pedestrian infrastructure. I mean, there's the little fact that the cycle path I was standing on here also ends abruptly on its north end? What? Taking a trip to Sydney's southwest, we see something similar on the M5 at Moorbank, where a cycle path abruptly ends at the M5. Bike lanes on motorways in general are pretty egregious, and they basically just comprise adding a bike symbol to the shoulder lane. Technically, that means that this cycle path on the M5 is actually better than what you'd normally see on Sydney motorways. Just a short hop away in Edmondson Park, there's just randomly a massive chunk of this cycle path missing for no apparent reason. And finally, in this booming new estate in Box Hill, along a road that plenty walk along to catch the bus, including school kids, there is no footpath at all. Why? What exactly is it that leads planners to fall short in these scenarios? I mean, can you ever imagine someone forgetting to finish a road? Well, I think that's part of the problem. No one would forget to finish a road because so many people use roads. But pathways? Well, our car-centric city means that they're used significantly less and therefore neglected. There's less of an impetus to finish these pathways since no one is using them. The thing is, no one is using them largely because many of them are woefully inadequate some of which end in the middle of nowhere. So, the neglect continues. It's a never-ending cycle. 
This type of never-ending cycle is perfectly encapsulated in the next example of questionable pedestrian infrastructure. Poorly located bus stops. Okay, here we are on Windsor Road in McGrath's Hill. Can you spot the bus stop in this picture? <laughs> Come on, what a joke. This is a bus stop with no shelter, no signage other than a pathetically small bus symbol, and no footpath leading to it. It's literally just wedged on the side of this 80 km an hour road. It's a similar story at this Parramatta Road bus stop in Lidcombe, which at least has a shelter this time, but <laughs> there's no footpath leading to it. And then we have this particularly shocking example at the Wakehurst Parkway in French's Forest. Shelter? Check. Bus slip lane? Check. Dangerous unmarked crossing across an 80 km an hour road? Check. Yeah, that's right. There's no way to get to this bus stop without crossing this 80 km an hour road. That genuinely sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. These bus stops all have one thing in common. Their bus routes all have very low frequencies. Low frequencies mean low patronage. Low patronage means less of an impetus to make sure people can safely get to these stops, which means neglect. Neglect means less people want to use these bus stops, meaning people end up driving instead. Again, it's a never-ending cycle. Safety at these bus stops is completely neglected. This is so uncomfortable. <laughs> Safety at these bus stops is completely neglected. Damn it, that's really hard. <laughs> nope, nope. How about there? How about that? Safety at these bus stops is completely neglected, but sadly, it gets worse than that. Curb cuts, where the curb slopes down to the road, are something very few of us actually consciously think about in our day-to-day -day lives. But they serve an important purpose in allowing those with mobility challenges to cross the road, such as those in wheelchairs, strollers, mobility aids, and more. Yet, once again, we'll quickly find that curb cuts have not been properly applied all over Sydney. At May Street and the Princes Highway in St. Peter's, the curb cut has not been made for those crossing the Princes Highway, dangerously forcing pedestrians briefly onto the road, where cars may in fact be turning into their path onto May Street. It's the same story at Jacks Street and Anzac Parade. Or is it Jacques Street? Whatever, I'm not French. A curb cut that dangerously sends pedestrians into oncoming traffic. With the crossing being unnecessarily wide, motorists can race off Anzac Parade into this crossing too easily. I fear it's a disaster waiting to happen. Perhaps most egregiously, here at this Summerhill roundabout, there's no curb cuts at all. This one particularly bothers me, since it's only a five minute walk from both Lewisham and Summerhill stations. Active transport links to public transport cannot be neglected because they're an essential part of encouraging more people to ditch the car and take public transport. But again, it's a vicious cycle. Lighting is another commonly overlooked feature of walkability. Would you feel safe cycling through a park at night in the dark? Because I know I wouldn't. So why have lights not been installed on the bike paths through Parramatta Park? Similarly, there's a walkway between Bella Vista Metro Station and its residential areas, which does have lights installed, but these lights aren't always on at night. Active transport links need to be versatile, adaptable to any circumstance, night and day, or else the car becomes the more tempting option. On that note, and I can't even believe this needs to be said, but active transport links need to make sense. After all, if they don't, if their routes are confusing and indirect, no one will want to use them. <laughs> one of the most infamous examples of this tenant being completely ignored in Sydney is the controversial $38 million Albert Tibicotta Bridge, opened in 2015. The bridge has needlessly long spirals, which turns this 50 meter crossing into a 750 meter walk. I don't know why they didn't add stairs to this bridge. 
it would have made it infinitely more useful, offering both cyclists and pedestrians a suitable option. Furthermore, the bridge isn't even located on the logical route from Central to the SCG, which makes its existence even more baffling. Heading back to Sydney's west, we come across the Windsor Road Cycleway, built with the Northwest T Way to link Windsor with Parramatta. It's a pretty good cycleway for the most part, until here, where it abruptly ends and forces you to negotiate residential streets to the next part of the cycleway. At least there's signage on the ground, but it's not the clearest. Surely a better solution could have been created, such as a wide dedicated path on these residential streets. But as is almost always the case, neglect and indifference is the cause for these fails. I mean, this sign which has been bent since 2014 is the physical manifestation of this apathy. But hey, at least in these situations, it feels like there's been at least some consideration for pedestrians, even if it's minimal. Sometimes, pedestrians aren't considered at all. <laughs> There's this stop sign located in the centre of a new footpath on Wetherill Street. Did they even consider that someone might want to walk here? What a hassle for anyone with accessibility issues, or cyclists. Then we have traffic lights that stay red for ages, as though the lights have just forgotten that there's a pedestrian there. This is the case at the Carlingford Road and Pennon Hills Road intersection in Carlingford, which apparently just doesn't turn green after 9.30pm. It's a similar story here in Hurstville, where wait times are quite long, particularly concerning since this is right outside an apartment complex, which no doubt would increase the number of pedestrians crossing here. The strode of the Pacific Highway neglects pedestrians excessively, with the long wait times reported at both Roseville and Taramara. Apparently, the wait times at Taramara outside its station can be so long, up to 5 minutes, that pedestrians frequently miss their train. As I said earlier, having convenient active transport links to public transport is essential, but in this case, the inconvenience makes the pedestrian feel second class, like they don't matter. So, they drive instead. But hey, at least in these scenarios, there is a logical crossing. I'm sure you're quickly learning that if it could be worse, then there probably is somewhere in Sydney where it is worse. I was really hoping that this crossing would turn green before I finished my script, but I guess it didn't. If you're walking north along the A3 at Gordon, you'll get to the Pacific Highway only to realise there's no way for you to cross the road. This is such a short crossing, but because there's no pedestrian lights here, a 600 metre walk triples in length to 1.8 kilometres. You may think not many people are probably walking beside the A3, a major arterial road, but the fact that someone submitted this to my form clearly means some people are, yet there's few enough of them that pedestrian accessibility here has been neglected. The vicious cycle continues. In many cases, at least the pathway does exist, but, well, pedestrians and their safety are further neglected when those pathways are poorly designed. Consider this bike path on 3rd Avenue at Blacktown. It's nice of them to build it, but then the bike path narrows drastically, with no gap between the road and the footpath. This is just plain dangerous, and it's repeated again here at Seven Hills, which is of particular concern as it's right near a busy intersection where cars frequently race into the left lane. Then you have this crossing just next to the Sackville T-Way stop on Sunnyholt Road right opposite Blacktown Boys High School. It seems as though they tried to increase capacity for pedestrians by zigzagging the pathway here. Sadly, they didn't consider practicality here, because apparently many people just take the shortcut around the line and stand on this tiny patch of dirt while waiting instead. Given how close this is to the road and how many school kids would be waiting here on an average school day, it's uh, quite a safety risk. There was a picture shared on Twitter recently, taken outside Meadowbank Station. Pedestrians, please consider motorists and crossing groups. This sign perfectly encapsulates many of the planning mistakes that we have made with Sydney's pedestrian infrastructure. Cars are considered first, 
and pedestrians are second class. And as I've said over and over in this video, by neglecting pedestrians, you dissuade active transport journeys, which only reduces the usage of this pedestrian infrastructure and furthers its neglect. Consequently, car journeys are being promoted. Expensive, polluting car journeys. Cars are necessary. I've never wanted to come across as completely anti-car, but true freedom comes from feeling as though we have a choice between driving and public transport. You shouldn't feel like you have to drive just because your active transport links are woefully inadequate. Public transport can be so convenient and with the cost of living crisis only worsening, people want to save money by avoiding car usage. And that's only possible if the active transport links to public transport stops are designed to a high standard. If transport for New South Wales are serious about 15 minute neighbourhoods, and I'm sure they are, then they must start by fixing up the infrastructure missteps that I've listed in this video, and the countless more that no doubt exist all over Sydney. So, to any planners and politicians watching, I implore you to consider pedestrians more and more. Don't assume that no one will use the pathway you're designing. Prioritise pedestrians and active transport. Don't fall into the car-centric mistakes that we made for decades. Design well-connected, direct pathways. Consider the needs of everyone, including those with mobility issues. Ultimately, everything just boils down to one point. Don't treat pedestrians as an afterthought. As always, it's the mistakes of the past that will lead us into the winds of tomorrow. Thank you for watching.